Um, welcome to the World Physiotherapy Congress 2021 online presenter training support program. This is today our first um, of a series of webinars and we see people coming in and we'll give it a few minutes uh, for people to log on and in the meantime I'll give you some background information. So this session is designed to specifically support abstract presenters, so those presenting uh, platform presentations uh, and poster presentations. My name is Birgit uh, and I work with the Congress Programme Committee to put together the content for our online Congress. And um, this is also as part of this role, I look after the support for you as speakers. So I'm joined today by Helen von Duddelson from Present Potential. Um, who is a professional speaker trainer and we have worked with um, Helen before when preparing speakers for um, our Congress in Geneva in 2019. But now as we have moved to an online Congress, we recognize that there's different requirements for you as speakers. And so we decided to run a set of webinars to help you with the preparation. So, this is um, just to give you a bit of an, an overview for those who are not so familiar with Zoom meetings, most of you might, uh, but just to give you a bit of an overview. So there's uh, an option for you to ask questions at any time and you will see this Q&A box at the bottom of your screen when you hover over it. Um, there's a chat function, so you can use this one to introduce yourself, to say where you're from so that other um, participants in this uh, webinar get an idea on who's around us. Um, everyone's on mute and cameras are off. We have quite a lot of people that we're expecting for this webinar. Um, we are planning to have run this, ses as this session for about 60 minutes, but we will be available for longer in case there are more questions that we can uh, then we can address within these 60 minutes, so don't worry about this. We are recording this session because we're planning to uh, upload it afterwards, so those people who can't join in live will be able to access it later on. In case you have any um, questions, any problems, any troubles with the system, you can send an email to info at world.physio and my colleague Rach will um, help you in case you've got any problems. So just to give you a quick overview on what we're covering today. So we will talk about the online formats, how platform and poster presentations will look like in this, for this online Congress, then give you a sneak preview of the online platform that we will be using. Then we'll have a, a time for a few questions. And then I'll hand over to Helen, who will um, talk about preparing and delivering the best presentation. And then we will um, have another set of questions that we can address. And then at the end, we will give you an overview on um, what needs to, be, uh, needs to happen by when. So before we go into the presentation, um, we would like to run a quick poll uh, to get an idea of you taking part in this session, how confident you feel about pre presenting at Congress. Um, and my colleague um, Rach will share the poll, so please participate and then we can get an idea on yeah, where you are at the moment. So there's still a few votes coming in. We see that, um, yeah, just a bit more than 40% feel confident. Um, only a few of you feel very confident. And we will come back to this question later on at the end, um, at the end um, of this webinar. Let's just wait for a few more moments so that everyone had a chance to participate in this poll.
And I think this gives us a good um, overview on where we are at the moment. I think we can close the poll now. Okay, so um, then we can move on to the um, different session formats. So platform presentations and posters are, as we all know them, uh, but in, a, in an online setting, they are slightly different. So we are having platform presentations, um, still the same, so they will take up to eight minutes. Um, we will ask you, um, as speakers of platform presentations to record these um, as an MP4 file. Um, they will be on, in a section that is called On Demand, so they will not be presented live, but as, an, um, as, an, as a pre-recorded presentation. Some of the presentations, some of the abstracts have been given the state of the art status by the Congress program. So these um, presenters will be given up to 12 minutes for their presentation. Then we have the e-poster presentations, and this is, the, I will give you a few uh, examples of how these posters will look like in, um, in, on the online platform. And what might be new for you um, as, an e as a poster presenter, you will be able to upload an audio file of up to five minutes uh, to accompany your poster. So this will um, give you an additional opportunity to explain some of the um, some of the details. So as I said, the presentations will not be live, so there is no dedicated presentation time for you. But it will be your presentation will be available throughout the three Congress days, so anyone can watch your presentation at any time during Congress. And then they will also remain available on the Congress platform for another three months. So this means people will be able to, um, to access, watch your presentation, listen to your poster uh, commentary and watch your, your poster presentation. So this is a sneak preview of the um, Congress platform that we're using. So this is what we will look on the landing page. So when people arrive and you can see there are these different buttons on um, yeah, different sections of the platform and you will be able to find um, posters and platform presentations on the, under the on demand button. So when you click on this on demand button, then there is um, the different sections of what is available on demand. And this is, as I said earlier, the poster presentations, the platform presentations. You will also find the award-winning presentations, the state of the art, and the recorded sessions. So this means uh, the live sessions from Congress from the day before or the morning before that are then also uh, available in the on-demand section. So this is an example of a um, uh, platform presentation and how this might look like on the, on the Congress platform. So it will have a movie file and if possible we encourage you to um, image capture so that we, the, those um, watching your presentation can also see you next to your slides because this is much more interactive. But Helen will talk about this um, later on in our, in our session. So then there is a comment section on the side and you can see this light green box on the right hand side uh, where um, those watching the presentation can post comments or questions. And so this is why we're asking you to check back on your presentation regularly during the Congress days because there might be questions coming up. Um, so that you can address them and get back to those um, inquiring about details um, on, your, on your presentation. And this is an example of a poster and how this will look uh, on the online platform. Again, this has uh, the comment section on the side, so the same applies to poster presenters, 
check back uh, to your poster page um, so that you can answer any queries and um, get back to comments, queries that you've received. As I said earlier, there's an option to record an audio file to your poster up to five minutes. And then I think what is really with this online format, which is great because you can then add further information to your poster by adding a QR code. And this means you can, let's say, provide a, a language translation or something additional, more supportive information to your poster that can sit on a website you can link to. So this is another poster option. Um, which is called the better poster. Some of you might have seen this before. It's a different structure, so it's less information on there. It is really about one main message in the middle, perhaps one key graph. Um, and the, 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 really the body of the information sits on a different website and again is accessible through a QR code. So this is a poster format that has been developed only recently and is used more and more and is more, um, more easier to read and easier to access. So this is an alternative option. And when you look at the um, um, poster presenting guidelines that we will share um, over the coming days, then you will see have templates for both for the traditional poster and for this better poster um, option. So now this is um, the kind of first set of the presentation and we can take questions from you if there are any um, and then move on to the next set uh, of the presentation of this webinar when Helen talks about the best presentation. So I can see a question here saying, uh, will there be an opportunity for Q&A for presentations posters during the Congress? So there is no, as I said, there's, it is not a live session, but people can watch your presentation at any time. So they can ask questions at any time. So when they watch it um, and they are in a different time zone than you are, they might ask a question three o'clock in the morning, your local time. So this is why we have the comments function where people can ask questions um, anytime. And this is why I stressed to check in on your, on your session page. So on your individual page where you will find the questions. Then I know that my uh, colleagues, we have got questions being answered directly to people. Um, the poster template available, whether it is available on the Congress, uh, Congress website, at the moment it's not, but we've um, almost finished the preparations for these guidelines and they will be shared with you as speakers so that you have access to the, to the um, guidelines. So there's a question, is there a limit for audio recording regarding state-of-the-art um, e-poster presentations? Um, so we have for both um, formats, state-of-the-art and um, poster presentations, five minutes recording time. So you have up to five minutes. If it's only two minutes, that's fine, but you can have up to five minutes for audio recording. So I think that at the moment there are no open questions as far as I can see. We can always come back at the end of our presentation uh, to answer remaining questions. But I would like to hand over now to, um, to Helen um, for her presentation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. It's great to see so many people. My name is Helen von Dardelson. It's a bit of a mouthful. I'm the founder of Present Potential, and my mission is to provide presentation and speaker training and coaching to build on existing skills and help you unlock your potential. I also worked for many years in international health conferences, so I really understand the international health conference world and how it's organized. So now Birgit has showed you what is expected of you, uh, depending on what kind of presenter you are. How do we get there? Let me share my screen.
So today I wanted to cover a different elements of putting a great presentation together. We're going to really give you the tools so you can go away and put a great presentation, whether it is a abstract presentation, a platform, or the e-poster. We really want the presentations to be as professional and um, engaging as possible on the online space. So we're going to cover firstly virtual presenting because it is different from in-person presenting. Then I'm going to look a little bit at the audience, who will be listening or watching your presentation. Some tips on how to structure your presentation, especially focusing on different ways of opening and closing it. Then we're going to look at the PowerPoint. And when I say PowerPoint, I mean Keynote, Google, uh, Google Slides, etc. And then look at a few elements of how to record your presentation. So first, before I start, you remember uh, when you registered for this webinar, you were asked, what are you most worried about when presenting on camera or virtually? And these are the results that came up. They're not surprising to me. Uh, the greatest feedback comes is that it's challenging when we don't have the feedback from the audience itself. We're sitting in our houses or in our offices speaking blindly to a camera and it's kind of different from being in a conference room when you have all your peers around you. The other concerns that came up were keeping the presentation interesting that's definitely a huge challenge and I hopefully will give you some tips on that today. And then the technological challenges. So not only do you need to be the expert in what you're talking about, but you also need to worry about recording it. Um, am I sharing correctly? Am I putting my PowerPoint together correctly? Does my, does my microphone work, etc. So it's quite obvious uh, challenges to me. And so hopefully today I will be able to address some of those for you. So as we saw, the most, the biggest challenge that you've, uh, that many people face is to be engaging when you're virtually speaking. It is really different from speaking in person. In the conference center, you have dedicated time for the event. The audience have traveled there, they've put their out of office message on, but in a virtual event, they often haven't taken time off and they're trying to fit in seeing as much as they can from the Congress into their already busy schedule. So we really need to step things up and make it worth their while to tune in. And of course, the audience may have many other things vying for their attention. They have other sessions they want to watch. They might get their email notifications. They might have to um, open the door for the cat or have the postman ring at the door, etc. Children, kettles boiling, etc. So really a lot of other distract distractions. So the most important thing is to keep your presentation lively. You want to give more energy and passion than you would if you were presenting in the conference center. The camera seems to dumb down or dull out a little bit of our energy. So in fact, we need to give more rather than less. And that's not necessarily natural for us. How do we do this? A couple of really simple tips first. Either stand up when you're presenting, which already gets the blood flowing and the energy going and the oxygen um, is freer to move. The other thing, if you're sitting down, you can actually be on the edge of your chair and grounded and engage, engaging your core. You know more about this than I do being physios <laughs> or involved in that world. So being on the edge of your chair makes you feel ready to go and you'll naturally give more energy. The other thing, and hopefully you'll see me do this throughout the hour, is looking directly into the camera. Now again, this is very tricky to do if you're not used to doing it. Uh, I do need to look at my notes sometimes and I'm keeping an eye on the chat, but whenever possible, I want to look straight into the, the camera so that the audience feels that connection with me. It's, it's the virtual eye contact. The other thing is to have energy and interest in your voice. So not speak like this, and my research is really important and you should take note. 
So you need to bring more. And yes, you can feel a little bit like an actor sometimes, but in the end, people are seeing us as though we are a TV presenter. So we do need to give a bit of that. The other thing I wanted to say about virtual presenting, and I'll talk about it a little bit later as well, is that we shouldn't hide behind our PowerPoint. We'll talk about how, how the, the uh, screen is set up and you've seen Birgit's already shown. If you are a platform presenter, you, we're hoping that you will record your face as well speaking on camera. And that's great because people want that human connection and just listening, it doesn't give them the same, same element. And remember that PowerPoint, and I'll get onto this again later, is not your script. You can prepare your script aside and then prepare a PowerPoint, which is engaging and interesting to look at and actually illustrates what you're saying rather than detracts from it. And for the e-posters, you also have the opportunity to highlight and add to what's in your poster. We're not expecting you to read through the poster. Okay, so again, we need energy in our voice when we do that, even if we're not on camera. There are a couple of other things we can do when we're virtually speaking to engage the audience better. You can challenge the audience, give them something to think about, give them a question, a rhetorical question, to think, get them thinking critically about what you're saying. And of course, Birgit's already mentioned the comment function. So hopefully through your presentation, you're gonna start that conversation and you'll be able to go back and see the comments and answer questions, etc. in that way. So before we open the PowerPoint, we need to know who we are speaking to, who is receiving our message. And this helps us keep really focused on this particular Congress and this particular audience. So who's in the audience? Who's likely to click on your e-poster or presentation? Well, it's difficult to predict, but we know that even at this early stage, we already have 1,600 registrations. And I'm expecting that number to, to at least double before we have the, the Congress. In any case, even though you don't know exactly who's going to attend or watch your presentation, it will be a diverse audience. This Congress attracts people from all countries. So it could be a student physio, or we could go all the way to the end of, um, end of the work life where it's a retired physio who's tuning in to see you. They could have different specialities, levels of experience. And you want to think about that before you put your presentation together. You are experts in what you're talking about, but the people listening might not be. Think about what they already probably know about the topic. And this may mean that you need to explain a little bit more context or technical information. And of course, beware of the jargon and acronyms that are part of your everyday language, but may not be for them. People from all around the world will tune in on all time zones. And many people will not be English mother tongue speaking, speakers. And probably some of you are also not English mother tongue speakers. So this is another thing we need to think about when we're speaking virtually is slowing down our language, our pace, and giving people a chance to tune into the accent. And you're probably trying to understand what my accent is. I'd, I'd be interested to see in the chat if anyone knows where I'm from without looking me up. Write it down in the chat if you can pick my accent. Speak as clearly as you can. We, you don't want to spend all this time and effort and energy putting your presentation together, but then people can't follow it because you're speaking too quickly. The other thing about everyone joining from all over the world is there are some people starting their day, like we are today in Europe, and other people's finishing their day. I think I saw someone joining us from um, India and Brazil, and they're much further through our day. Some people will be watching on a screen, and other people might even be watching on their um, small smartphone. So these are things we need to think about when we're preparing for our presentation. I'm going to see if anyone knows where I'm from. 
Ah, we've got a winner. Miriam, you are correct. I am from New Zealand. Australia, South Africa, not English. No, I'm from New Zealand, but I've lived in Europe for almost 20 years now. So it's, it's a funny accent now, I must say, but I'm embracing it as you should. Great, so now we know who we're speaking to. Once we know our audience, we can think again, before we open the PowerPoint, we can get them to think what we want them to think, feel, or do after watching or listening to our presentation. Now that might seem silly. You say, well, I want them to understand my research or my case study, but you have lots of information to share and you want to think specifically about what you want them to take away from it. Yes, it might be a transfer of knowledge, but it's probably something more than that. What do you want them to do? Is it for them to contact you to offer collaboration or ask a question? Maybe you want people to replicate what you've done, maybe in a different setting. You could have a future employer in the audience on the lookout for their next star. There might be a potential funder out there who's on the search for the next hot thing. Maybe your methodology is really unique and you want to inspire the audience to try it out and test the results in a different circumstance. The point of you presenting is in person or virtually is really to give the human element to bring your research or your project to life. So what this is called a call to action or a key message. Being clear on this will help you choose what information to include in your audio or your, um, your video presentation. What do you want to highlight? And you all have limited time from five minutes up to five minutes for the audio, the e-posters, or an eight or 12 minute video. And that goes really quickly. So you do need to be focused on what your key message is. So I'd like you to do a little bit of work right now. Some quick fire questions to help you start thinking about your key message. Some of them are, why should the audience listen to me instead of someone else? It's a big conference, lots of content. Why would they listen to what I'm saying? Why would they listen to what I've got to give? The second question is, what do I want them to remember about my research or my project? What one thing? And ideally, you can get this key message down to a really short sentence, like a bumper sticker on the back of a car or on a billboard. Just a few words so we can really retain that and take it away. Write it down now. This is really going to help you on, on the rest of, of putting your presentation together. Why should they listen to you instead of other people? What do you want them to take away from your presentation? And obviously you can rework this. You can discuss this with colleagues later, try different things out. But right now, just jot down a couple of ideas of what your key message is, what your call to action is. What do you want your audience to think, feel, or do after listening to you? And you'll notice that we do this before we open the PowerPoint software. And that's really important because I know what it's like. We open the PowerPoint and we start playing with fonts and finding a nice picture and we totally lose our focus. So really be clear on your key message before you do anything else. So now we know who we're talking to, a really diverse audience from all around the world, all levels of experience all levels of spe um, all types of speciality in the physio world. We also know where we're taking them. That's what I talk about, the call to action or the key message. It's like the end result, where we want to take them in, on our presentation. Now we need a strong structure to help lead them there. And it really depends on how much time you have available 
and where you're leading your audience to. Is it the so what of the findings of your research? Is it the implications of the field? So we hopefully you've got some ideas of a key message or a call to action already written down. Now I'd like you to think of three maximum, maximum four points that you absolutely need to include in your presentation so that they, you can take them to that key message or call to action. And this way we only have three or four, then we can properly concentrate on them, explain them well, illustrate them well, and leave everything else out. What immediately comes to your mind? Which things, elements do you absolutely need to include? Write them down. Now you'll probably think, well, my whole, my methodology and the intro, that's all important. Of course it is. But remember that what you say, what you're presenting, either audio or on camera, actually illustrates your abstract. So when I'm watching your presentation, I want to be grabbed. I want to want to know more. And then I will go and read your abstract. Same for the e-poster. You've got lots of information there. What should I focus on? You've only got five minutes. So what should I focus on there? That's why we need to just choose only three or four points to focus on. Everything else you can leave out. It doesn't mean it's not important. It just means that that's not the leading the audience to the key message that you want them to. And it's worth reading through your presentation at an early stage to make sure it's not too long. Because five minutes, even eight or 12 minutes goes much quicker than you think. And it's easier to add in details than to take them away afterwards. So now we know who we're speaking to, we know where we're taking them, and we know what elements we want to include along the way. How will you close and open with impact? You probably know of the importance of primacy and recency effect. I want to grab them at the beginning, make sure that they stay for the full five minutes, the full 12 minutes. And when they leave, when you finish your presentation, you really want your message to be reverberating in their ears. So how can you do that? So I've got some suggestions for you for opening. You want to start strong, not, hello, my name is Helen, today I will. You don't need to do that, they have that information already. Grab them right from the beginning. Use a story, a relevant story about a, a patient or a situation, even a metaphor that helps describe the point of your research. Use a question, whether it's rhetorical, or it could be the question that you asked yourself when you started this work. You could use a relevant quote, or you could have a problem that you want to solve. And you want to really focus your audience attention and establish your credibility right from the start. The opening is important to give them a preview. Why should they stick around and listen to the entire presentation while there's so many other presentations they could be listening to? It's infinitely easier to keep an audience with you if you engage them from the start. Make your topic sound interesting. Make them want to stick around and listen to it and pay attention. So that's the beginning. And once you've got them, you, they're more likely to stay with you. Obviously, you don't want to the end to sort of peter out either. So for the closing, you can summarize your main ideas. Leave the audience with a challenge or a resolution, maybe a resolution to the problem you posed at the beginning. Link back to the opening whenever you can. That gives a nice sense of resolution for the audience. It's sort of the circle being closed. Remind the audience why it was worth them listening to you. 
And you don't need a thank you side. Don't worry about that. You can have your acknowledgement, but you don't even need to say anything. You can have that up at the end. And hopefully they'll be thanking you for your wisdom and insights and for that, that you've shared with them. The other thing is to know your timing and keep within it. So notice, we've already defined the audience and structure before we open our PowerPoint, okay? Our PowerPoint, whether it's a presentation slide deck for the platform presenters or an e-poster, it does not replace the presentation. It does not replace what we say. It's only a tool. It's only one part and needs to support the message and delivery, not take over or distract. And that's why it's called a visual aid. It aids, it helps. It is not the presentation in itself. So you can think of your slide deck or e-poster as a way to illustrate and support what you're saying rather than repeat or replace it. So how do we do that? I'm sure you've all put many uh, hundreds of PowerPoints together in your career so far. So how do I suggest you do it, especially on this online space, because it does change it. As we saw, the PowerPoint takes up a lot of the screen for the audience. And it needs to be engaging, otherwise people will start looking on their phones or you know, getting distracted with whatever else is happening around them. So what do we see? We see the PowerPoint, slide deck or e-poster. And then for the, um, if you're an abstract presenter on the platform presentations, you have a small opportunity to put a small video on the side, or you just have the voice if it's an e-poster. So it's similar to what we're doing here today. You need to spend time on preparing both elements for optimal impact. As the PowerPoint does take up so much of the screen, it's really important to think carefully about what to include there. We want it to illustrate and complement what you say, as I've already um, told you. Now, the most important thing here for me is remember that people cannot read and listen at the same time. So you'll see, I'm trying to set an example here by showing you the sort of uh, PowerPoint slides you can use so you're forced to listen to me. If I give the, these, pow these the PowerPoint slides to you in a PDF, you won't get the elements that you would as I'm speaking to you. So they hope, help, hopefully help illustrate what I'm saying, but you still need to listen to me to get the message. So this is all great in theory, but how does it work in practice? Well, I'm going to give you an example of how to create a PowerPoint presentation. And some of the elements that I talk about will be quite PowerPoint specific, but many will also be translatable to the e-poster and be useful for that. And anyway, hopefully they'll be useful for your future presentations as well. This is a very typical slide. Actually, it comes from the 2019 Congress. It's an abstract slide. Tell me in the chat, what do you think about it? Not the content, but what it looks like. T tell me what your first impressions are if I'm putting up this as an abstract presenter. Good and bad. I want to hear it all. Too busy. Too much text. A lot to read. Good. You've already understood some of my points here. Boring. Boring. Too wordy. Not engaging. Lots of information. Too lengthy. Too much information. Too long. A lot of words. Okay. So you get the point here. Okay. I think you will agree, this is quite typical of what we see. But you see, do not highlight exactly too much information, a lot to read. You cannot possibly read what that is written on that um, slide and listen to me at the same time. It's just impossible. No picture, exactly. Um, at least there aren't too many colors. That's a good thing, I think we could say. And it's quite clearly um, laid out. Good contrast and fonts, exactly. Thanks, Dara. Okay, so, but we know that this is typical and most people do it like this. How can we do it differently? 
Well, <clears throat> first, I think the most important thing is to make sure that the information we pull out is really key. And for this one, I did find that it's quite logical um, three points that you could include, but they basically become your script. Okay. Um, if each of these messages merits it, you could have one slide per sentence or idea or message. However, for this one, I don't think personally they merit one each, especially because, you know, with the abstract, this is usually at the beginning, you're explaining the context, etc. You probably don't need one slide for each. So how could you do this differently? Here's an example. We all know that long bouts of sedentary behavior, especially sitting, has long-term detrimental health effects across the age range. My colleagues and I wanted to identify the key physical, physiological, and psychological outcomes that were influenced by acute periods of inactivity. Our findings show the importance of avoiding prolonged bouts of sedentary behavior. Ultimately, we want to get the message out there to inform older people, professionals, and organizations working with older people and policymakers on what duration of sedentary behavior will lead to adverse outcomes in older people. So what did I do? I actually took the main points from the abstract, from the one before, and I used them as my script. I probably should have simplified the language a little bit because it was difficult for me to say. It's more written language than spoken. So I took those bits and I, I told them a little bit more like a story. I made it conversational. And I used a simple image, a relevant image that I got for free. Actually, I used the PowerPoint function. You can insert a stock image uh, of an elderly couple biking along and a simple headline, keep moving. This is the call to action. This is the whole point of my, my research and what we've found. This slide illustrates what I'm saying, but it doesn't distract from it. And you still want and actually need to listen to me to understand the point of the work. As an audience member, you are probably more interested and you have the necessary background. I've brought it to life. I've brought the, what does it mean for the future? And we could also use this in the closing. So as I said, you know, with the circular resolution, it can be really helpful for the audience. You say something like, with the same image maybe, what does this mean for the future? We need to spread the word of the dangers of a sedentary lifestyle. Thanks to our research, we see that sitting for more than two hours may have potentially harmful effects on blood pressure, fatigue, and vigor components of mood in older adults, and the benefits of breaking up long period of sitting. We now call for interventions to support this in older adults to improve both cardiovascular and metabolic health. Isn't that much more interesting than reading my bullet points? I think so. Now, the challenge here is that with your research, most of you have some data to present and we can't just have pretty pictures all the time. We need to present the data. How do we do this? Here's another one. This is a data slide from the same research, actually, as you can probably tell from the colors and a typical, very typical slide that we would see at conferences. Again, in the chat, what do you think about this slide? What works well? What doesn't work well? Let's see what your in initial reactions are. Too many colors. Yeah, the colors are distracting. To see the good statistical findings, too much information, a lot of information. It's not clear what to look at exactly. Nice colors and contrast, but too busy. Too much information, distracting, too much to process, too much information. Well, imagine looking at this and I'm talking at the same time, which I'm doing. You, you have to work really hard to decipher what these, these two graphs are showing. Too much information, don't know where to look at first, not clear. Okay, if you're interested and know the issue, sure, but you, you can always do that after the presentation to look into those details. Difficult to read. Too many colors, info very small. Yeah, 
So I think you get the point. This is probably copy and paste from the research, which is fine. And we know that all the data is really important and must be reported on. However, your presentation is accompanying the abstract where all the data is presented, whether it's video or audio. And during your precious limited time to give voice to the research, you only need to include the data points that lead the audience to your conclusion or the, the key message. So what did I ask before? Why should they listen to you? What do you want them to remember? You can focus on those data points rather than trying to present every single thing. It doesn't mean they don't exist or aren't important. People can go to the abstract and dig into more details in their own time rather than, and this is exactly the point of the data. So you would look and oh, that's interesting as well. Maybe you make other conclusions that the presenter doesn't. But when they're speaking, when you're speaking to your data, this can be quite distracting. So how can we present this in a more accessible manner? Well, here's one way. Maybe I've simplified a little bit too much. First of all, unclutter the slides. Too much data at once does not help the audience. And in fact, those two graphs, I think, didn't need to be on the one slide. The only reason you'd put two graphs on one slide is if the audience is, needs to interact between them to compare and contrast. And that wasn't the point for these two. They're really separate data points. So we can take one at a time. And as we said before, otherwise we're busy interpreting, trying to understand, compare, etc., and we forget to listen to the speaker. So I took here the mean arterial pressure. It's just one of the key results and it's shown simply so that the audience can remember it easily and you can talk to it. You can give more details in what you say, and remember that the audience can dig down into more details from the poster or the abstract. Here I've kept it really simple. No, two colors, no design whatsoever. And of course I could add some animation. Really simple animation can be very effective. I could bring in the base number 94, talk to that, how you, how you measured that, etc. cetera, how many, um, how many people you're working with. And then you could bring in the 102 so that we don't automatically start thinking about those two numbers together. We focus and follow the, follow the speaker as they bring in those numbers. A really simple animation like that can be very effective in uh, presenting data. You could also make it look much more nice, nicer with a, a good relevant picture or um, you know, putting the numbers in a box or a circle or something like that. But this I did really simple just to, to illustrate the point. And I hope you agree that this is much easier to interpret and also speak to than the previous version, the busy, busy graph. Doesn't mean the graph doesn't exist anywhere, it does. But for my presentation, I want you to focus on these elements. Then you can do this for all of the key data that you want to report on and give a dedicated slide to it. So you're focusing the audience's attention. My biggest takeaway for the PowerPoint is people can't read and listen at the same time. So what do you need to do? Limit the amount of information you put on any slide. It's better to have 50 slides showing different data points than trying to cram it because you think, oh, I've only got eight minutes, therefore I can only have eight slides. That's not true at all. If you use the slides well, it doesn't matter how many you have. If someone cannot understand that slide within three to four seconds, it's too much information there. So look at pulling out keywords and phrases we cannot read and speak at this and listen at the same time. If you need the audience to read something like a quote or something, a, um, a testimonial or something like that, then you need to be quiet for a few seconds to let them read or you read it along with them. The layout of the slide needs to be light and have some empty space to help focus the attention. The texts, the tables, the graphs should look integrated using the same colors throughout. 
um, avoid changing to different uh, fonts or, for example, shadow, bold, italics. Yes, these functions all are available, but they're not necessarily uh, helpful. So just use them with care. You can use a bolded word or two. That can be very effective, but don't go overboard. Same with colors. Select colors of high, high um, contrast. So it's easy. So the, the audience doesn't have to work too hard to, to read what's on the slide. Um, and limit the colors to only two or four. And that includes for your graphs. If you're including a graph or a chart, use the same colors. Yes, that means you probably need to redo it from the one that comes automatically out of the statistical uh, program. But anyway, this will challenge you to focus on what data points you actually want to include in that slide. Then use, use images whenever possible. Humans by nature are visual creatures. You all know the saying, a picture paints a thousand words. Well, that's true. And using images rather than words can really help the audience remember and quickly get the point of your presentation. Get relevant images though, and high quality images. And now it's great, there are so many websites where you can get royalty free, great quality um, uh, images that you can pop into your presentations. And keep it simple, okay? Don't have too many animations coming in and out and things flashing and things like that. That's just distracting, keep it simple. And the final thing for the slides is practice speaking to them. The worst is when you come to a slide and think, oh, I forgot to say that, or I should have put that first, or what am I supposed to say here? Practice speaking to them. The great thing is that you're recording your presentations. So you can record and record and record, and this is practice until you're happy with the results and you have plenty of time now to do that. Okay, I wanted to just pause here briefly and see if there are any questions on the PowerPoint because I did cover it very quickly and gave you lots of information. Some websites from Anne. Yes, there's um, Pixabay. It's a good one. Uh, let me just, here we go, Pixabay or um, within, within PowerPoint as well, there's, um, there are stock images. Uh, what are some of the other ones I use? I usually use Pixabay. Um, don't know, Birgit or Rachel, if, you, if you're used to using one. I use Pixabay most of the time, honestly. Very good. Do we have any questions about anything I've covered so far? Thoughts on infographics? Do you have any links? I think, Shaza, that's a great question. I think infographics can be fantastically powerful. Um, totally recommend them. Do I have any links? No, I generally create my own infographics. Um, you know, I use the simple icons, they're called icons, yeah, icons in, in um, PowerPoint, bring them in, make sure they're the same color and nice and neat and clean, and they can be very powerful ways of describing things, yes. Can we, where can we get samples of e-posters. So the uh, World Physio um, will send you, I believe, Birgit, you're nodding, <laughs> will send the examples to you so you can see what that's like. I really recommend that if you have an e-poster to have a look at the better presentation, um, better poster, sorry, hashtag. Uh, I had a look a couple of weeks ago and it it will challenge you the way you're used to doing things, but I think it can be really effective in terms of getting the message across in a short amount of time and really focusing the audience's attention on the elements you want to um, get across to them. To what extent for the five minute videos related to post presentation, can we also use images? So when you're talking about the e-posters, um, you're not allowed to use a different PowerPoint. All you have is the e-poster to speak to. So here I would recommend that, again, the design of the poster needs to be very clear and focused. And then when you speak to it, you can, um, you can say, for example, in the top right, you will see this, um, this graph, which, el which illustrates X, Y, Z, etc. Does our video go along with the PowerPoints? 
Yes, and I will talk about that next. <laughs> I will talk about that next, about how the, how the video. How good, any other questions? Birgit, did you want to add anything there? After seeing that or hearing those questions? Yes, <clears throat> there were a few questions, one on the platform, whether there would need to be a separate audio file. So this is one file. So you've sent an MP4 file, which includes your presentation, your slides and the audio at the same time. So the audio file we were referring to was only applicable for the e-posts where you have one static image and then you have additional audio commentary as an MP3. Right, good. Did that answer that question there? Thanks, good. Great. So, we have done, I feel like I've got covered that all very, very quickly. I hope, um, I hope I didn't lose you, but please stop me. And, and as we said at the end, we'll be available for additional questions as well. So great, you have your presentation ready, you know what you're saying, you know who you're talking to, you know where you're taking your audience, you've got a beautiful, clear, uh, focused presentation. Now you need to record it. Lights, camera, action. So what do we need to think about here? And it is very important. The first thing is the camera. Now usually your laptop camera is good enough quality. If it's not, if you see that you're pixelated or the colors aren't clear, then see if you can borrow a different camera from someone. You probably have someone around you who has a better quality, whether it's your institution or a colleague or friend. You have time to organize that. So that is something that's really important. Get a good camera if your built-in one is not good enough. But honestly, most of them are. So you've got a good camera. The next thing is setting it up correctly. Now often, I've got a little clip on camera so I can play with it a little bit here. Often we see presentations like this. Have you seen this before? Okay, or like this. <laughs> this means the camera is not set up correctly. Same thing here. Okay, if you can see too much of your ceiling or too much of your um, floor, the presentation, uh, the camera is not set up correctly. What you need to do is find a space where you can put your laptop or your camera at eye level and flat on eye level. So not looking up or looking down. That might mean you need to put your laptop on a pile of books or on a shelf or a box or something. And that's what I do sometimes when I'm not presenting um, in here, my, my little home office. So that's really important because you can, it changes, it distorts the face and it just doesn't look professional and it's an easy thing to fix. So that's the camera. The next thing is lighting. So this is great. I've got a great example here. Natural light is fantastic, but if you have it behind you, like this, <laughs> it doesn't properly work. You look like a silhouette, okay? So it's worth thinking about the time of day that's appropriate and the right positioning. Ideally, you have light which is behind your camera, illuminating your face with not too much shadow. And this might mean that you need to get your bedside lamp involved in the, in the picture, or you need to find a bit of space in your office or in your, your home um, and play with that a little bit. Natural light is great, but it's not very reliable. If it's face on, it can be lovely, but at the right time of day, I could not present right now because it's too bright. And I would not be able to see the screen and read what I want my notes to say. So play around with it. Put on more light than not. Okay. Check with someone else if you're not sure. The other thing is obviously sound. So again, most uh, modern laptops have a good enough built-in microphone. However, they tend to pick up a lot of background noise. So um, if any of you are in a, another session where you're presenting live, it would be worth having a, a plug-in um, headset. In saying that, even for these presentations, you need to see what kind of quality um, voice you get from your microphone that is built into your laptop. If necessary, plug in 
even the ones in your ears or a, a cask um, headset to improve the quality. It is important. No one's going to listen for you for 12 minutes if it's <laughs> crackly or or they can hardly hear you because you're speaking like this. It, it, it's just, it's, it's a pity. So, you know, have a play around, see what works for you. You don't need to buy necessarily a good microphone, but again, in your entourage, maybe you have people who have a good, you know, plug-in microphone like this one that I've got. I invested in this because I do this a lot and it's useful for me and it's a great um, change to the quality. So it's worth it for me. You don't have to, but again, don't leave this to the last minute. These are things you can work out right now uh, and start asking around for help if you need it. In terms of background, what should you do? We're in, most of us are in a very particular situation right now where we're pretty much stuck at home. So again, this is something that you can plan for. Try to find a space with a more neutral, clean, professional background, okay? Um, if you have too, much, too many things happening behind you, it can be really distracting for the audience. And again, that's just a pity. So that might mean you need to sit at your, um, your table or to be standing um, in your corridor if you have enough light to find the right space for you. Now, some people like using virtual backgrounds. My take on virtual backgrounds is they can be a little bit, I would say, dangerous. You know, I'm sure you've seen people sort of fade in and out of, <laughs> of the space. Unless you have a very flat surface behind you or a green screen, then I think stay away from virtual, virtual backgrounds and try to find a space that works better. Now, the other thing with the setup is what you wear. Now, you, should, you do not need to be in a, in a shirt and tie. You can if you want. The important thing is for you to feel good in your space so you can perform well. So wear what you feel comfortable in that looks professional. Um, you can actually, World Physio told me that they would be happy to see you also in your traditional costume if that's something that you would, would like to put on. Make sure that the colors are not too busy though, okay? Block colors are much easier for the camera. If you've got lots of patterns, it can distort things, especially on a, a, um, a not very good quality um, connection for, for people. So, but do think about these things as well. Once you've got your setup, remember what I've already said, eye contact. The eye contact on the virtual world is looking straight into the camera and it does require some practice. Some people like to put a picture, a photo or maybe a soft toy behind their camera to remind them and help them feel like they're actually talking to someone rather than into the void. So that might be worth you, you trying out as well. And really take the time to get your setup as good as you can within the circumstances so that you feel comfortable and so that you look professional and you're giving it your best for the recording. Just take a minute now to not note down what, if anything, you think you need to look at in terms of your technical setup. Do you need to find a better place in your room or your office? Do you need to borrow a better camera or a microphone? Do you need to maybe move around the lighting a little bit to make sure you have enough light? Is there a better time of day or maybe night when you can control the elements a little bit more? Then have you scheduled time in your calendar to practice? Not on the 10th or the 11th of March, please. <laughs> You should be aiming to definitely do this before the end of February so that you can deal with any last minute glitches and if you need to re-record. And it is recommended that you record and re-record. Have a look at what it looks like from the audience's perspective. Maybe you also need to ask for help from someone a friend, a colleague, um, or a, uh, someone in the household who can help you set it up or hold the camera or whatever it is. 
and then practice. Practice until you're comfortable with your setup and your content and moving your slides and speaking to camera and all of these things. It's worth scheduling time to make sure that you're practicing. Make sure that you have enough enthusiasm and energy. Sometimes it will feel like you're giving too much, but you probably aren't. Because as I said at the beginning, a lot of the energy gets sucked out from the camera. And then you're ready to record. So how do you record? Well, personally, I find the easiest is to do it on Zoom because I'm familiar with Zoom. So here you would set up your own meeting and you would have your PowerPoint ready. You would share the slides and then you would hit record. Okay, and you can record in the cloud or on your local computer. But you can also use MS Teams if you've got the Microsoft suite. You could use Loom. You could use WebEx. You can even use the inbuilt um, apps that you probably have on your computer. So what you're looking for is uh, for the platform presentation is a, an application that can share screen and capture video at the same time. So we can see your beautiful faces as you're speaking. If you are doing an e-poster, as Birgit was saying, all we need is a, the, the e-poster and the audio capture. So that could, that could be on um, the same apps or not, but just without the, without the video. And there are lots of instructions available online for all of these tools. So again, don't leave it to the last minute. Make sure you know what you're doing or you bring in someone who can help you do that. And do some trial, trial runs, some practice runs to make sure that you, you, you've got the best capture, the best recording as possible. Are there any questions? I saw a few questions come up here now. Is there a due date to upload? Yes. Um, Birgit will talk about the due date um, after my presentation. Good. Oh, Birgit's onto it. She's answering all the questions too quickly. Do you have any questions or concerns around the virtual setup and your recording of your presentations? Don't be shy. I don't see any questions. We are going to stick around for a little bit longer to answer other questions at the end. Okay, I don't see any, so that's good. That's a good sign. So just before I go, before I hand back to Birgit, I want you to tell me in the chat, what one thing are you going to do differently, <coughs> excuse me, or stop doing? What's your biggest takeaway from this? I know I've given you a lot of information. What's that one thing you're going to commit to doing differently this time or to stop doing or to try? What are you taking away from this? Tell us in the chat. Reduce words on your slides. Yes. <laughs> Practice your presentation repeatedly. Yes. Less text, less text. Focus on the main Key message. Oh, I'm so glad that you got that. Um, people cannot read and listen at the same time. Yes. So keep it simple. No virtual background. Need in practice. Uh, need to practice in time. Yes. And practice to make sure you're within the time you've been allocated. Bring in better pictures for PowerPoint. Reduce the words. Less is more. Key message in my head in my PowerPoint. Great. Be more impactful. Yeah, it's a great opportunity for you to show, showcase what you're doing. Try to use storytelling. Yeah, storytelling or a metaphor. We didn't talk about that much, but that can be really powerful to engage the audience on a human level. Open and close the presentation with impact. Um, do not open PowerPoint yet, unless you know what you want to say. Yes, <laughs> try to talk to the camera. Focus on how to start and close, not just read the text for the audio, make it interesting, have energy. Yes. No presentation. Oh, that's challenging, Claudia. I'm not sure what that means. Maybe you can tell us more. Perhaps use better posture. Yes. Simple main points, engage with questions. The slide deck is not the presentation. Yes. Know the top four elements and describe them. 
no personal presentation. Ah, right. Yes. So that's what I said at the beginning. You don't need to explain to people who you are on the platform. They will be able to see your name, your institution. Um, I guess you probably have a little bio as well in there. So you don't need to waste your precious time talking to that. Great. Thanks, Claudia. Good point. Be enthusiastic. Engage the audience before starting the PowerPoints. Yes, I got it, Claudia. Great job. So good. I'm so glad that you took something away from this. Um, really powerful stuff. It's not easy, but you're on to the right, uh, right track. And I can now hand back to Birgit. Thank you, Helen. There was a question on video editing software, whether there's anything that you would recommend. Sure. I have used various um, apps for this. Uh, Firstly, yes, it is allowed from what I understood from Birgit. And this, for people who don't know what we're talking about, you know, when you start recording and then you're like, oh, but I need to share my screen. You want to cut out that sort of messy part at the beginning or at the end. Okay, for example, or maybe you start really well one time and the rest wasn't the very good. So maybe you want to put two recordings together into one file, the best um, recording. So that simple editing is okay. I have used, um, and I'm not an editor at all, but I have used, I'm looking on my laptop here, OpenShot Video Editor, which is an open source uh, application, which is pretty easy and uh, quick to use, I must say. Um, I know that um, on the Mac, you also have the built-in function, which works pretty well. And the other one that I use on my laptop is... Um, Is it? No, it's not media. Oh, I can't remember the other one. Let me have a think about that and I'll see if but I can. But we can include this, Helen. We can include yeah. this in the written guidelines. So once we can have a, um, uh, some, some links to, some to recommend it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there, whilst um, uh, the session was going on, and I'm aware that we're already um, over the full hour, but we said we would be available for a bit longer. I just wanted to... Um, um, cover a few questions that came up, and there were two about language and QR code. So um, the QR code is essentially um, a tool for you to link uh, your visitors to the presentation or to the poster to an external website. So you would need to find either through your institution or employer a website where you can host additional content. So this will not be on the Congress page, but it will sit externally somewhere. And the QR code is only a tool to get um, viewers from the Congress website to this um, external website. And uh, linked to this, there was also a question about language. Mm. So you will record your audio commentary or your presentation in English. So this is um, our common language on Congress. If you would like to provide additional language translation for your, um, for your poster or your, for your platform presentation, you can do this. But this will be as an add-on accessible through the QR code. So this is really important. Your presentation will need to be in English, your audio commentary to be in English. And if you want to provide additional languages, this can be done, but would need to sit externally and can be accessed through the QR code. So these were really two questions that came in about language. Um, I would like to get back um, to the timeline because this was also a question that came up. So, oh, when do we need to upload our presentation? And this here, this slide gives you an overview of the upcoming dates. And as you can see here on the, um, in bold is the 11th of March. So this is the day by when you would need to upload your presentation. Um, your poster and your audio commentary. So this is really a key date for us and we um, hope you will help us to, to get this all together by the 11th of March because we have a lot of uh, presentations and posters to process and please help us with this deadline. And uh, the overview also gives another few dates. So um, end of March, the embargo will be lifted on abstracts. And as you all know, the live days for Congress will be from the 9th to the 11th of April. 
And then, um, as I said earlier in the presentation, all content, all pre-recorded on-demand content will be available until 8th of July, so for another three months. So before concluding here uh, the presentation, I think, or we thought as a team, it would be a good idea to come back to um, the initial question that we asked. And my colleague Rach will launch uh, the poll again. So um, after you've heard, got a lot of information from uh, Helen and myself, how do you feel now after this webinar? So people are still voting, but perhaps you remember from the beginning, there was a 42-43% of um, webinar participants who felt confident and only a very small share who felt very confident. So and what I can see really that this number has increased quite a bit. So at the moment, 17%, very confident, and 57%, so really more than the uh, then half of those of you who are participating, okay, not very confident, uh, is um, a small share at the moment, but hopefully <laughs> when you take on uh, the advice um, and the tips and guidance that Helen has given you, uh, this will increase. And the advantage, as you said, Helen, is really that people can record and take their time in recording and making sure that they're happy with the setting. So I think this looks good with the poll. So we have 87% um, of the people who have participated in the poll now. So I, I think we can close this. It gave us a good picture, a good overview on um, where we are, um, yeah, on confidence levels. So um, I think at this stage, it is really for me to say thank you, Helen, it's really much appreciated. So you gave us so many tips and so many ideas. So I feel now, I think, oh, I could have done so much better in my presentation. But I think we learn as we go along. So really helpful for all your guidance. Also, um, thank you to Rach, my colleague in the background, who was helping with setting um, all the presentation up. Uh, also a note, I think it is important for you, this was the first set of, uh, the first webinar that we conducted, there will be others tailored to different uh, formats of the Congress, so for people who are speaking in focus symposia, uh, workshops, seminars, so those have, who have a presentation and live discussion, and then we have a separate webinar for those involved in sessions where there is no PowerPoint, so where there's discussion sessions, an inspiration session. So if you are interested uh, in other webinars, please check out the website and sign up for these uh, if they are relevant uh, for you. Um, yes, we are really excited about this new format. Um, let me just quickly, before we close off, go back to the questions, whether there's anything um, coming up. So there was a question, specification for e-poster, so we will have this in the written guidance on the format, um, etc. We will provide this and send it with you. Um, when can we expect, expect to receive the written guidelines? So we uh, have finalized these and get these out to you as soon as possible. Then there was another, I think, I need help in designing the poster or using a format. So this is where we said we will provide in our guidance, we will provide a template that you can use if you do not have one from your um, institution or from your employer. So you will be able to use the template that we have. Okay, so I can't see any more questions at this stage. Um, if there are further questions that you have, you can either join in. We will have the, the, the same webinar um, on uh, abstract presentations again next week on um, Tuesday, 23rd of February. I won't mention a time because I'm aware that you're all in different time zones. So if you would like to uh, join this again, you're welcome to do so. Or you can watch the recording that will be available um, also um, soon. Okay, great. So thanks a lot. Look, looking forward to seeing you all at Congress in a 
digital and online world. Thank you. Bye-bye.